Over the last two weeks, um, I've given you an opportunity to, to explore some of the different beginning introduction areas of journalism. Um, today I'd like to go do a short lecture um, on the history of journalism. Humans were born to go gossip. Primatologist Robin Dunsbar theorizes changes in food sources allowed early humans to walk upright. Environmental changes made it possible to feed many individuals in one area, increasing social interactions. Distances between food sources forced long separations of group members. Grooming was a key way of keeping track of group members. As groups exceeded the number groomable, about 150, they had to find another way to keep track of one another, so gossip slash language evolved. The ancient Egyptians and various other cultures created hieroglyphics to record stories. That was around 3300 BC. The earliest written language was discovered in Sumeria around 3000 BC. It's now called cuneiform. From cuneiform and other pictographic language, an alphabetic language where symbols stand for consonant sounds evolves. The earliest written alphabet is ancient Aramaic and is the precursor to the modern day written Arabic. In ancient Greek in 600 BC, we go from gossip, songs, epic poetry, and we get hand copied manuscripts. Then 2000 years pass. In 1456, we have the advent of the Gutenberg printing press which was primarily used to print Bibles, so now we were able to get religious texts into multiple people's hands rather, rather easily. The first periodical was issued in Latin in Cologne in 1592. It was semi-annual, which means it was twi uh, pr uh, published twice a year and was distributed at book fairs. And it was called the Mercurius Gallabilicus. Latin is not my forte. <laughs> the first regularly published newspaper was in English was the Oxford Gazette, and it was published in 1665. It was begun while the English court was at Oxford, Oxford because of the plague in London. When the court returned to London, the, the paper went with it. American newspapers in the colonial period. In the British colonies, printing was regulated by the Press Restriction Act, which required that printers' name and place of publication be included on each printed document. Um, the first printer in the colonies was Stephen Day at Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1638. Day himself does not seem to have been a printer. He was a locksmith in Cambridge, England, and in 1638 he contracted with the Reverend Jose Glo Glo Glover a wealthy dissenting clergyman, to set up the first printing press in the colonies. Although Glover died on the sea voyage, Day and Glover's widow set up the press in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and by March 1639 it was in full operation. So now we had the ability in the colonies to print things much quicker. In 1662, Massachusetts law forced printers to have a license which contributed to suppression of the press. Um, if you, you had to go to the government to get a license in order to be allowed to print. If the government didn't like what you were printing, you didn't get a license. Benjamin Harris's um, public occurrences, both foreign and domestic, uh, was, it was suppressed for content and license in 1690 because of the types of things that he was um, publishing. The first real colonial newspaper w um, was printed in 1721 and it was James Franklin's New England Current. The authorities of Boston became enraged because James constantly makes fun of them. He gets thrown in jail and has to pretend his younger brother Ben is the real publisher. Ben the, runs the press while James is in jail in 1723. When James get out, he doesn't thank Ben for running things in his absence. Ben breaks his apprenticeship, which is a serious offense, and sails to New York, but the only printer there doesn't need any help. Almost broke, Ben heads to Philadelphia. His boat from New York gets caught in a hurricane. He has to walk three days across New Jersey, but Philadelphia is the land of freedom for the 17-year-old printer. <laughs> 
By the American Revolution, par papers were abundant. There were 89 papers in 35 different communities published during the 1770s. And there is an example of the Pennsylvania G Gazette. The Stamp Act of 1765 um, had a big issue on um, big effect on journalism. Most newspapers at the time of the American Revolution were anti-royalist because the they opposed the Stamp Acts, which tacked newsprint. Um, newspapers could only use paper that had received a stamp indicating the tax had been paid by making it easy, which made it easy to suppress papers by denying them the stamp. So, in order to sell your paper and print your paper, you had to get a stamp from the government. Well, that also meant that they got to see what was going to be in, going to be published and presented to the public. If they did not approve of what was in your paper, you simply didn't get a stamp. You hadn't paid the tax. You it was then illegal for you to publish that material. Um, truth and responsibility in reporting. Early U.S. newspapers were not focused on. Re reporting things in a fair and balanced way, as we hope newspapers are today. They were used as a way to slam the opposition party's positions or to persuade people to their views. So they were more seen as a way to try to convince people to think the way you think. After the Jefferson administration, the industry became more independent and less partisan, owned by private enterprises with real editors rather than party hacks. So now we saw newspapers that were more interested in reporting new, the news versus reporting persuasion. Political machines and propaganda. When Andrew, when, when Andrew Jackson became president, he started his own newspaper and press. He funneled both government printing business and information to it, forcing the other Washington papers out of business. A typical newspaper post-revolution. By the mid-1800s, typical newspapers were weekly or semi-weekly, short and aligned with one or the other political party, so the Whigs or the Federalists. Other than local news, much of the reporting was simply copied from other papers, sometimes verbatim, which is now considered plagiarism. In addition to news stories, there might be poetry or fiction or, especially in the later century, humorous columns. So because you have to remember, we're very spread out at this point. So we still have difficulty sharing news across large areas. So they're going to be very locally focused. And if you can't fill the paper, you're going to have to fill it with other things. The rise of the great newspapers. In the 1850s, technology advanced and new massive presses that could print thousands of copies of a paper every hour increased potential circulation. The emergent Emergence of illustrated newspapers, which were still mostly weeklies, suggested the possibility of merging articles with images. So now we were starting to see some drawings potentially um, show up in our newspapers, which gave them a little bit more character and interest. The New York Herald. The New York Herald was founded in 1835 under James Gordon Bennett, and it began the modern concept of a newspaper. It was People were charged a penny for it rather than the usual six cents. This meant that it was that the average person could afford to purchase this newspaper. Um, circulation, that's the distribution of the newspaper, topped 40,000 within 15 months of opening. It was the first paper with a city staff covering regular beats. That means that there was a reporter to, um, to cover government. There was one to cover industry. There was one to cover commerce and, um, and maybe... Um, different and crime, those kinds of beats. In 1838, Bennett organized the first foreign correspondent staff, which was six men in Europe, and placed domestic correspondents in key cities, including Washington. So this meant that he now had people working for him in six, six men in Europe and people throughout the United States in order to get information and report from different areas of the country for his paper. So now his, new, his news in his newspaper was not just local. He also used fast offshore boats to rush foreign news from, from incoming ships. This was important because there is competition. So if he can get a boat to go out to a foreign ship, get the news that they're bringing with them from Europe, and get that news printed first, 
he's going to sell more papers. Papers that followed the Herald. Other papers saw Bennett's success and followed his examples. The New York Tribune was begun in 1841. It was more liberal. Karl Marx was briefly a London correspondent, and it cre crusaded for unionism, abstinence, and abolition. It led the way with technology. The New York Times was established in 1851, and it established the principle of balanced reporting and high-level writing. It is also known as the Old Grey Lady and the Paper of Record. And of course, the New York Times is still in existence today, one of the most widely read newspapers. Wire services originated in 1848 with the creation by six large New York papers of a news cooperative and provide coverage to provide coverage of Europe. A news cooperative is a group of newspapers that get together and pay a fee in order to share news. Um, this is extremely important even today because, of course, no newspaper can have a journalist in every city at every event for everything. The Civil War Reporting for the war really drove competition between papers. Everybody wanted to have the front page news. They wanted to have the most up-to-date stories. The short, crisp style of journalism was born because reporters had to send stories via telegraph or by rail. So there wasn't, you didn't have time to write these long, flowy pieces of journalism. If you were sending by telegraph, it had to be short and sweet. If by rail, you wanted to get it on that next train and get it back to your publisher as soon as possible. So you didn't have time to spend days perfecting your story. New York was the center of news. Um, Ms. Midwestern papers developed with much more local for focus. Um, obviously, they were still cut off from much of the world. But New York remained the hub of news activity and international coverage for decades. Western papers did contribute two major forces in American journalism. After building fortunes with Western newspapers in the first 25 years of the 1800s, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer established two more New York papers. Um, Hearst established the New York Journal and Pulitzer established the New York World. Um, the Pulitzer Prize is named after jo Joseph Pulitzer. Yellow journalism um, is a concept that by now you should have seen a couple times. Hertz and Pulis Pulitzer competed by printing more and more sen sensationalist stories known as yellow journalism, named after a Pulitzer car cartoon called The Yellow Kid. This kind of journalism became looked down upon and was followed by muckracking. Journalists who would hunt down and deliver sensational stories that were directed toward the public good, not just sensational, to sell newspapers. Okay, so muckracking was about finding sensational stories that were actually good for people to find out. The yellow journalism, on the other hand, is they sensationalize stories. They kind of stretch the truth in order to sell papers. 20th century saw the um, advent of investigative reporting. So from muckracking, where we're trying to find sensationalized stories that are actually true to sell our paper, we turn to investigative reporting. Um, Upton Sinclair, he was considered a muckracker, um, publishes his book, The Jungle, in 1905, which uncovered the unsanitary conditions of the meatpacking industry and leading to passage of the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act. If you have never read The Jungle, I strongly encourage you to read it. It is probably one of the best pieces of investigative journalism. Um, it also may make you want not want to eat meat for quite some time. Um, a little bit about some important people that we're, we see in journalism during this time period. Ida Tarbell. Tarbell wrote a 19 segment series published and published articles in McClure's magazine criticizing Rockefeller who is the president of Standard Oil and his monopoly in the oil business. She dug into pop public documents all over the country to uncover the shady business dealings of the oil industry and oil magnate John D. Rockefeller's personal use of strong arm tactics to eliminate rivals. He responded to these ta attacks by describing her as Miss Ta Tarbarrel, but significant damage was done to his reputation. Nellie Bly, it was a pseudonym for Elizabeth Cochran. She was a reporter whose journalistic style told the stories of ordinary people. Her information was often obt obtained by going undercover. She is most well known for faking her own insanity just to get into New York's insane asylum on Blackwell's Island. 
Radio Kills the Prince Star? In 1895, Marconi sends the first transatlantic radio signal. By the 1930s, radio competes with print for the coverage of news. By using radio, now we didn't have to wait for the story to be written, it to be printed, and it to be get gotten into the hands of the reader. Now we had the radio broadcasting the waves almost immediately for us. And then we went from to newsreels. By the 1930s, newspaper has serious competition from newsreels, which is film and radio. When you would go to see a movie, um, they would pay, play a newsreel first, which would be a compilation of news stories from throughout the country or throughout the world, which were film, and greatly, um, people were greatly interested in them. Because of this, a number of small papers go out of business. However, the larger ones consolidate, especially during the Depression. So this is where we see New York, the new, big New York newspapers start to combine into one, the New York Times. Um, so we get the... Plus, we get the idea of newspaper chains developing. In 1950s, TV news cuts into the news action. So now we have television, news, t TV in our homes, newscasts that we can watch on a nightly basis. The news is brought right to us. Edward R. Mar Morrow, he was already famous for his radio career in the 1940s. He led news into television as well. As CBS News Vice President and Director of Public Affairs, Murrow wanted to return to reporting in 1951. Although he was wary of television, he made the transition with See It Now, the first television news magazine. Murrow also interviewed celebrities in their homes in the popular Person to Person segment. This show supervised some people who preferred the more serious Murrow. The serious Murrow took on the Red Scare and McCarthy in 1954. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Red Scare, this is the idea of the spread of communists throughout the United States. Um, Walter Cronkite, another famous name in American journalism. Cronkite was named a CPS anchor for, um, for the 1952 Democratic and Republican conventions. This new job to coined the term anchor. Cronkite's popularity grew after the 1950s, and the CBS started the first half-hour show with Cronkite as the anchor. One of the most famous news anchors in history, Cronkite is best known for the moments he broke from the script and delivered his own opinion on air, particularly on grave topics. Woodward and Bernstein, hopefully by now you have heard their names. They were on your scavenger hunt. In 1972 and 1973, Bob Woodward worked with fellow Washington Post reporter Carl Bernstein on stories that led to the resignation of President Nixon in 1974. Supported by the Washington Post editor Ben Bradley, the pair submerged themselves investigating the Watergate break-in. Eventually, their investigations of the break-in revealed a scandal involving the committee to re-elect the president and Nixon himself. Many of the high-ranking committee members and members of Nixon's administration were indicted on federal charges of burglary and disrupting Democratic Party activities. In 1973, Woodward and Bernstein won the Pulitzer Prize for their stories. Hunter S. Thompson. Thompson. He was originally a sports journalist who worked for Rolling Stone during the late 1960s and 1970s and has published several books. He is called the father of gonzo journalism because of his manic writing style and twisted lifestyle, including the use of practically every recreational drug known to man. Um, gonzo journalism is characterized by the author inserting him or herself into the action and reporting on it from that perspective. Um, often with, unfortunately, often with a warped angle due to drug use. So, if there was um, a group that was in, of interest, he would immerse himself in that group and have to become a part of them and report from that way, which meant that he often had to do things that maybe were against his own moral character. In the 1980s, we meet Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch became one of the world's media giants during the global media revolution of the 1980s. He merged 20th Century Fox Film Corporation with several independent television stations to form the Fox Television Network in 1985. Fox was the first new television network in the United States to be created since the 1950s. Today, Murdoch is still one of the most powerful and influential individuals in the global media market. Oprah Winfrey, somebody you all should be familiar with. In 1984, Winfrey moved to Chicago and began hosting AM Chicago, an ABC affiliate's morning public affairs show. Within three months, her show had outscored the ratings of the popular national talk show hosted by Phil Donahue. Winfrey changed the format of daytime talk show television, providing a platform for honest, sincere discussions of sensitive and sometimes controversial topics. 
Her nationally syndicated Oprah Winfrey show was one of the most popular shows of the 1980s and lasted into the next century. And now she owns her own network. <laughs> Um, Barbara Walters, also a very um, famous journalist. Uh, Walters worked two years as the Today Show's first official female co-host. She was part of the news team sent to report on President Richard Nixon's historic visit to the People's Republic of China in 1972. In 1984, ABC wanted her to return to her anchor desk as co-host of the news magazine 2020. Um, since then, Barbara Walters has pretty much interviewed everyone worth interviewing. Um, she is like the go-to woman journalist. Um, and interesting enough, she was told that she would not make a good broadcast journalism because she had both a lisp and a stutter. Um, but she has been able to overcome them and be extremely successful in her field. MTV Muses Merget MTV merges music and television into video. The first seeds of convergence media are sown by MTV in the 1980s. In the 1980s, also, color is added to USA Today. Layout becomes more prominent. News has to look good to compete. So if you see the difference between the New York Times and the USA Today, um, they're, they are looking for very different audiences. Um, they're not for the same group of people. Uh, the New York Times tends to not quite be, especially in this example, although it's better today, not quite as flashy. It's news. Um, USA Today, color images. We also start to see a lot of experiments in design, looking at different ways to do the layout to get people to pick up our magazines, to pick up our newspapers. Um, we want people, we want people reading them. And journalism aims to keep. I mean, think about it now. We have, at the touch of a hand, your iPod, your iTouch, you can get the latest news. You don't have to wait for it. What is convergence? Convergence is the intersection of all of these things. The internet, the TV, radio, newspaper, MP3s, and your phone. Media convergence. It's all coming together. It's all working together to provide you with up-to-date journalism. Some things about mobile journalism. Mobile journalism is the name for the new specialty of journalism in which reporters photograph, take, and edit audio and video, write and package their articles for print and web. It requires numerous skills to succeed as a mojo. Jobs you can get with a background in convergence media include publications, information services, online broadcasting, mobile journalism, news research, public relations, marketing, and sales. All right. Um, I know this has been long. Um, there are a couple questions in the assignment that I would like you to answer about this. But again, this was a very, very quick, brief, in many ways, overview of the history of journalism. Some of it is more interesting than others. If this is something that is interesting to you, I really encourage you to find some other resources on it. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there, and there's a lot of neat people in journalism. Um, that you can definitely explore. If you have any questions about this week's assignments, please let me know. Have a good day.